The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone. Today's webinar will begin in approximately three minutes. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Advanced Spatial Analytics with the Science of Wear. This webinar will begin in approximately one minute. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Advanced Spatial Analytics with the Science of Wear. This webinar is part of the GeoConnects webinar series for these two industries. My name is Tom Coolidge, and I am Esri's Pipeline and Gas Utility Industry Manager. As today's webinar facilitator, and on behalf of all of my colleagues, I hope you'll find our time together today to be interesting, informative, and helpful to you and to your organization. Now I'd like to introduce two colleagues from Esri's Utilities and Telecommunications team, Joe Wirtz and Tyler Polarczyk. Joe is an account executive and Tyler is a solution engineer. They are teaming today to present the content of this webinar. The 2018 GeoConnects webinar series has been put together to give you a more complete understanding of how a modern GIS platform can be used within utility and telecommunications companies. In March, the series began with a webinar on the complete GIS platform. Then a second webinar looked at data management. That was followed by one on monitoring. Then we looked at external stakeholder engagement. After a summer break in September, we focused on field mobility. Today, we look at analytics. 
If you missed any of these earlier sessions, don't worry. All the webinars are recorded and the links are available. Looking ahead, we call your attention to three happenings. The first of those is the next gathering of the GeoConnects community. That will happen November 5th through 8th in Dallas at the Omni Dallas Hotel. Registrations already are running strong and an outstanding program is in place. The event will feature a plenary, user presentations, technical workshops, hands-on learning lab, peer connects networking sessions, exhibits, a social, and more. If you haven't already, we encourage you to check it out and do all you can to join in with your many peers who will be there. Also ahead of us are two webinars on the utility network. One is focused on electric and gas utilities and one on transmission pipelines operated by vertically integrated gas companies and standalone operators. Please look for more details as they become available. Before we get started, please take a moment to note the webinar control panel on your screen. I would like to encourage you to post your questions as they occur to you during the presentation in the GoToWebinar questions dialog box. We will answer as many general questions that can be answered concisely as time permits after the webinar. Questions requiring longer answers and some technical questions that are better answered by one of our specialist colleagues will be handled individually after today's webinar. And if we can't answer all general questions during today's allocated time, we'll answer them in an FAQ document which we'll distribute afterwards to all attendees. Please also note you can switch between telephone and computer speaker audio and adjust your view to full or partial screen. And again, please remember today's webinar is being recorded. Here's a brief overview of today's agenda. First, we'll look at the language of spatial analytics. Then we'll review the value of spatial analytics in utilities and telecommunication companies. Next, we'll explore some spatial analytics case studies. And finally, we'll focus on how you can get started in using spatial analytics. As you may recall from the first webinar in this year's series, Esri offers a complete modern GIS platform. ArcGIS can be thought of as a system of systems, including a system of engagement, providing capabilities for sharing and collaboration, a system of record, providing data and capabilities for data management, a system of insight, providing capabilities for analytics. That's the subject of today's webinar. A system of IoT, providing capabilities to consume in real time data data from sensor networks, and a system for developers, providing software development kits, application programming interfaces, and other tools enabling you to create additional functionality, extending that functionality already available in the platform. And for this webinar, as I said, we will be focusing on a common pattern of use for the GIS system of insights, analytics, which helps turn data in the system of record and elsewhere into actionable intelligence to achieve better business outcomes. The ArcGIS platform provides extensive capabilities to help you meet this pattern of use. Now, please welcome my colleague, Joe Wirtz. Well, thanks, Tom, and hello to everyone joining us for today's webinar. As a community who's familiar with GIS, you understand the impact and value of visualizing data. Mapping and visualization are the first and fundamental business pattern for using GIS. Seeing your information on a map can be incredibly helpful, but visualization is only the first step in getting real value out of your data. Honestly, there's a variety of applications out there that will allow you to throw dots on a map, but think about it. Does that really provide you actionable information? As professionals in your industry, you likely already have a sense that there's far more business impact you can drive with a complete GIS platform. At the heart of analysis is data. Spatial analytics is a key to unlock the real meaning in data, to turn data into information. 
There is a difference. You could be rich with data and still be information poor. Spatial analytics turns rows, columns, and records into business intelligence and actionable information. There's something called Tobler's first law of geography. It goes something like this. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. That seems to make a lot of sense, but what tools do we actually have to understand those relationships? We typically start the process in our minds. Visually, when we look at a map, we immediately start asking and answering questions like, where are things? How are they related? And what specific area is being impacted and why? Inherently, visualizing maps, data on maps, is a terrific way to start evaluating data. It's the first step in understanding, but by leveraging spatial analytics, we can derive far more powerful trends, relationships, and answers to many of the more complex issues we face in our companies every day. Before we move on, let's do a quick audience poll to get a sense of where our users are in their deployment and use of spatial analytics. So you'll see the question here on the screen. Do you have a clear understanding of how and where spatial analytics can be deployed within your company? Please start to uh, select an answer and we'll gather up the results and share with those, uh, the results with everybody after they come in. Uh, the choices we've offered today are, no, not really. I'd really like to learn more about the technologies, maybe somewhat. I've seen applications like this in my company that leverage analytics of some sorts. Or maybe, yes, your company's already having good success with analytics today. So we've got our answers are coming in. We'll wait just another couple minutes, another minute or so for these to finish up. Okay, why don't we go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So it looks like uh, a nice, actually a nice distribution. We got some people are just now starting to look into the idea of how analytics might be used within their company. About half of the uh, respondees are indicating they're already starting to put it to use, at least to some degree. And uh, about 25% are actually seeing good, good applications of analytics. So that's uh, that's a nice mixture. Okay, well, how do we define these terms or tools around this particular type of analytics? At Esri, we like to use the language of spatial analytics. You've heard the expression, to get the right answer, you have to ask the right question. Spatial analytics is, at, is about asking the right questions. The questions we tend to ask fall into some key categories. The one we most always tackle first is understanding where. Exactly where are valves, switches, or at-risk gas lines? Maybe the location of critical public service points like hospitals and schools? Or what zones and regions have corrosive soil types? You know, measuring can be very helpful, like calculating the size or length of features or measuring the distance between a cell site and our, say, our wireless coverage gaps. Another category is determining how things are related, like what is nearby or coincident to a particular item, or summarizing how many faulty transformers are within an area. Finding the best location or path is often a key to resolution, maybe deriving the best locations that satisfy a particular set of criteria, or finding the best route or path along a network. Then there's detecting and quantifying. You know, what are significant hotspots, anomalies, or outliers in our data? And are there any spatial patterns that are changing over time? Ultimately, we want to arrive at making qualitative and quantitative predictions. For example, predicting how and where things will be impacted or forecasting future requirements. Okay, we've put a little more meat around these tools and terms that power location analytics. Let's go back to our audience with another poll to gauge how mature their adoption of analytics is. So our question for this poll is, where would you rate your company's position in employing spatial analytics to solve strategic business problems? Go ahead and start providing an answer. And again, we'll provide the summary in just a minute or so. 
choices we've given today are no real plans yet. That's just maybe it's just coming on your radar at this point in time. Uh, could be some out there or using it for just basic usage, doing the, the initial understanding of where things are, doing some basic measurements. Some of our uh, attendees may be looking at more advanced uh, applications where they're starting to actually determine where, you know, how places are related and finding the best locations for things like supply depots or other things. And then there might be a few out that are actually looking at very advanced usage, detecting and quantifying patterns. So we've still got some answers coming in. We'll give it just a, a little bit longer and then we'll close that out. Thank you for your uh, interaction here with us. Okay, looks like this kind of slowing down. Let's go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So uh, yeah, again, about, um, about half of the audience looks like they're just uh, using it for some of the initial but important usage of where assets are, where information is geographically, which is a key first step. And um, you know, about 40% are actually starting to move forward into more advanced usage. So that's, uh, that's encouraging to see. And I think we'll actually start to talk more about that throughout the webinar today and give you an, uh, some insight in terms of what that looks like. So this whole discussion would probably make a lot more sense if we look at this topic in relation to the utilities industry that we all support. So let's shift the discussion from the theoretical to some concrete examples and demonstrations in the electric utilities industry. Now the world which uh, electric utilities operate is changing dramatically. Smart grid networks, cybersecurity threats, and the expanding sources of distributed generation are just a few of the challenges that electric utilities face today. Nearly all these trends require the deployment of vast amounts of devices and sensors that are collecting information and discrete data points like no other time in history. With that, electric companies are looking to take the next step in GIS, from mapping and visualization of data to performing advanced analytics. Let's look at a few examples. According to the Energy Information Administration, almost half of all electric customers are now serviced with smart meter technology. AMI provides utilities with the opportunity to perform all kinds of analytics to gauge the health, monitor the performance, and manage the daily operation of networks. For example, Duke Energy has launched an enterprise distribution system health initiative, leveraging spatial analytics which has provided Duke the ability to more effectively manage customer complaints, as well as create the proactive planning approach for new infrastructure improvement investments. Let's look at another use case, Mid-South Synergy. It's a Texas-based electric co-op managing over 3,000 miles of electric lines that crisscross national forest land. Drought conditions have killed many trees in that area which inevitably fall on power lines, becoming one of the leading causes of power outages. Leveraging ArcGIS Spatial Analyst, USGS soil composition layers in the Esri's Living Atlas, and Synergy's own network asset data, Synergy was able to identify areas of highest risk and then prioritize veget vegetation management work, resulting in a 90% drop in customer trouble complaints. A third area of interest deals with outage analytics. This use case highlights the amount of intelligence and insight that can be derived using location analytics on large data sets. Without applying the right tools, critical information might be otherwise lost in the noise of millions of records of performance data. Let's take a deeper look. Centerpoint Energy is a domestic energy company headquartered in Houston, Texas, that provides electric transmission and distribution service. Centerpoint has spent years and significant amount of capital designing and constructing their intelligent grid. Centerpoint has leveraged Esri GIS technology for years to support mapping, visualization, and asset management. To help them drive more intelligence from the millions of discrete data points they continuously collect, Esri worked with their operations team to explore what this treasure trove of data could tell them about service outages and how they can improve performance. Using Esri spatial analytical tools across a time slice of 400,000 records in the Houston area, 
our team uncovered some actionable information that would be difficult to see using traditional non-spatial tools. For example, when outages are most likely to occur, what device outages were meaningful, which ones should be considered as the highest maintenance priority, an insight into why outages were occurring in the first place. You know, rather than just describe it, let's pivot to a short demo. Hey, Tyler, you are going to show us some of what this analysis looks like. You got that ready to go? I do, thank you. I've used the insights for ArcGIS application to better understand where these 400,000 plus outages have occurred to see what kind of intelligence we can derive from that. What we're looking at now is a workbook I put together using the historical outage data. If you look to the left, you can see the data set we used. And if I open that, you'll see the fields that were used to build the workbook we're looking at. For example, I used my location field to create a map showing clusters of outages in the Houston area. I have also used my customer account field to create this map showing outages as individual point data symbolized according to how many customers were impacted. I also used our device type field this time to create this bubble chart showing me the distribution of device types that were causing outages. And lastly, I used our outage start time field to create these windows in our bottom row. My time series shows us how these outages have occurred over the course of a year and a half. And to no one's surprise, we see that these outages start to emerge around the spring summer months, of course, during the hurricane season. And as we start to enter fall and winter, we see a steady decline that is then followed by a steady increase as we start to hit the spring and summer months. My bar chart shows me how these outages are distributed through the course of a week. And I can see that the beginning of the work week is when we start to see the most outages on Monday and Tuesday. And my last bar chart shows me how these outages uh, vary over the course of a day. I can see that starting around 8 a.m. as people are going into work and businesses are kicking on their air conditioners, we see a spike of outages that remains pretty consistent up until the time people start coming home from work. So by visualizing these six different representations of the same data, I could be in the pull out some pretty valuable insights to help me make better business decisions, like prioritizing my workforce according to the time of year or according to the day of the week, or the time of day. I now want to identify those specific devices that are causing us the most trouble. So I'll open up a new workbook, and I brought in that same outage data from before, this time summarized to the device level. What that allows me to do is take my outage count field and filter out any uh, devices that don't have at least 50 outages. When I do that and bring that into my workbook, I can see we're dealing with a much smaller subset of our data. And I now want to compare that side by side with our total outage minutes. You'll notice that as I brought in this content, Insights read the values in my field and then chose the best symbology to represent those values. So in this case, it used accounts and amounts symbology type. I'm gonna bring in our outage device type, this time in the form of a donut chart. Then I'll select multiple fields like our device ID, outage count, outage minutes, and total customers impacted by outages. I'll bring that in as a table. So with my new workbook, I can make two key observations about our data. One, our outage count field tends to have an inverse relationship with our outage minutes, meaning those devices that have a large number of outages assigned to it don't actually last that long. And vice versa, the, outage, the devices that do have long or cause long periods of outages don't have a ton of outages assigned to the device. Now there is one exception. This transformer is responsible for 559 outages that span close to 30,000 outage minutes. If I go to my table, I could pinpoint that exact device using its unique ID so we know which device we need to address out in the field to see why it's acting faulty. 
Another observation I can make is going to my donut chart and choosing to see only the fuses that have more than 50 outages. When I do that, I notice that we only have four and they all happen to be around this area. If I look to my table, I can see they can make up a good chunk of outages, but luckily they appear to only be momentary. That being said, when I look at my customer outages field, I can tell there's a lot of customers that are experiencing these outages, so this needs to be addressed. If I go back to the map, I'll notice that these fuses all happen to be around William Hobby Airport. So although they could be faulty devices that need to be fixed or replaced, there's a better chance that our network wasn't engineered to handle the load and demand coming from this airport. So by understanding where, I was able to visualize our historical outage data from multiple angles to better prioritize my workforce, find the devices that are causing us the most trouble, and identify areas in our network that we should reconsider re-engineering. Joe? Hey, thanks, Tyler. The interactive query and analysis you can do when you link those data views together is very powerful. Let's shift the conversation and take a look at the gas utilities industry now. You know, having natural gas service to heat our homes and provide us with warm showers is something most of us just take for granted. It's just something that's supposed to work safely and reliably. But as recent history has shown, delivering gas or other utility services is a serious business. More than just a convenience, lives and property depend on executing this efficiently and safely. One of the more critical areas of focusing on safety is DIMP. GIS is integral to helping gas companies create and maintain distribution integrity management plans, or DIMP. Using spatial overlay tools and geoprocessing models, spatial analytics is making it faster and more effective to maintain infrastructure while providing the tools needed to meet the reporting and performance regulations mandated by FIMSMA. City Utilities in Springfield, Missouri is a great example of a company using GIS to support DIMP. They developed a predictive leak model that considers the potential impact of leaks in a given serving area. Using data analysis, clustering algorithms, and condition assessments, City Utilities harnessed the power of GIS to prioritize gas main replacements. PICO, the largest gas utility an electric utility in Pennsylvania, is using GIS to improve their identification, response, and resolution of gas odor trouble calls throughout their network. Clustering and emerging hotspots identify trouble spots and allow for proactive maintenance and repair. You know, we often think of the application of GIS in terms of the critical role it plays in the engineering and operations organizations of a utility. But GIS and spatial analytics technology can be extremely useful in all facets of a utility's business. Take, for example, a situation where analytics played a role in enhancing the ability of a gas utility to increase the effectiveness of their marketing and sales of natural gas services, resulting in new customer revenue. Simco Energy Gas Company supplies natural gas to more than 280,000 customers in Michigan. One key challenge was driving new revenue. Years back, they needed to grow their customer base during a tough economy where there was little new construction. Simco was looking to increase their market share by moving customers from competing heating sources like electric and propane to natural gas. Leveraging purchase data that, was provi that provided residential locations using those alternative heating sources, Simco created uh, GIS models that analyzed and identified target customers close to their facilities that they could easily market their services to. Using analytics wrapped with automation scripts, the utility identified 10,000 potential customers, prompted 600 inbound calls from their direct marketing efforts, and gained over 150 new customers in areas that required very little construction due to the proximity to their facilities. This initiative minimized the cost of acquiring new customers and helped keep their operating margins high. Hey, Tyler, I think you have a couple demonstrations that'll illustrate how GIS can have an impact on these other areas of utility. Let's see what you got. Thanks, Joe. 
I now would like to show an analysis in ArcGIS Pro for finding the best locations to market utility services to. The first thing I want to do is find the areas within our service territories, which are these polygons on the map, that fit the specific demographic profile we're looking to target. To do this, I brought in a census block layer from Esri's Living Atlas and clipped those boundaries around our service territory. I then used a geo enrichment tool to append the demographic information I was interested in to these polygons. Once I define my input, I could then select the demographic variables I'm interested in. Now this tool is actually tapping into our ArcGIS Online web services, which allows me to leverage all the content and demographic data we host up there. So in my case, I want to know which households are not using the public utilities gas to heat their homes. So once I type in my search word, I can see a breakdown of households according to their heating fuel. So in my case, I want to know how many households are using oil or kerosene, how many are using tank gas like propane. I also want to know how many households are using the utility gas, but I'm going to change that total number to a percentage. That way I can target those lower percentage areas. Once I select my variables and I run my analysis, I'll get a new output that has my same block groups, but with the appended demographic information. With that, I can begin to visualize this information in a few different ways. Here, I can see how many households are using oil or kerosene. Now I'm looking at households according to those that use tank gas. And now I'm looking at the percentage, uh, the lower percentage of households that are on a public utility gas network. So what I want to do now is target those block groups um, I'm interested in for my analysis. So I've applied a filter that only shows the block groups that have more than 100 households on either oil or tank gas and those that have less than 50% of their households on the utility gas. When I do that, I end up with these targeted block groups we're going to focus on for our marketing. The next thing I want to do is take our marketing leads of addresses within our service territory and determine which ones we want to market to. So to do that, I'm going to open up a model we built in Model Builder. Now a model like this allows me to organize multiple individual geoprocessing tools into a single repeatable workflow. So in my case, the first thing I had to do was geocode the addresses in my spreadsheet of potential customer addresses, then use the ArcGIS Online World Geocoding service to create a point feature class. Now that I have my addresses, I want to identify which of those fall within the block groups we're targeting. When I do that, I end up with these lighter green points. The next thing I want to do is find the addresses that are within a re relatively close distance to our existing pipes. That way, if someone does want to connect to our services, we can do so fairly easily. Before I do that, I ran a buffer around my gas pipe layer using a specified distance of 500 feet. Now with my buffer, I identified the addresses that fell within there, which are these orange points. I then removed any addresses we already had in our customer billing system, meaning there are already customers with us and came up with our final results of addresses we're going to target in this campaign. My last step is really to get this into the hands of those in the marketing department that want to start uh, targeting these addresses or marketing to them. Naturally, we're going to have a few folks that want these addresses in the form of a spreadsheet, so I made sure to include my export to Excel tool within the model. But fortunately, ArcGIS Pro can publish this content as a web layer within our portal and we can distribute that layer throughout our maps and apps we have deployed there. Or in my case, 
I can add those addresses to my existing potential customer's web layer. And once I do that, I can bring those into something like a dashboard that allows us to monitor the status of the campaign. Here I can see how many people we've contacted to date, how many have been converted, how many have declined our services, and how well we're making progress within the campaign. By using ArcGIS Pro's geoprocessing tools with the help of some online web services, I was able to find the best locations to market gas utility services to according to their proximity to our pipeline and the specific demographic profile we're tar we were targeting in our campaign. Joe, back to you. Well, we've looked at a few examples in electric and gas. Let's talk about telecommunications. Telcos, cable companies, and wireless providers providers don't lack for competition, or do they ever really reach the point where their networks are fully optimized? The business drivers in this industry demand that they maximize every dollar of revenue while deploying network technology as effectively and efficiently as possible. The business areas where analytics can be applied are really quite diverse. With a portfolio of service and delivery options, the communication service providers who lead the market are the ones who drive analytics deep into their business operations to offer the right mix of services and a, to a diverse set of consumers and businesses. What are some business applications that highlight this? Well, bandwidth analysis is one example where a local telecommunications company leverages location statistics to identify increasing pockets of demand for bandwidth. Armed with this information, they can adjust their network planning and expansion models to deploy additional fiber or DSL facility nodes. Market analysis is a critical function of marketing and advertising campaigns that are designed to target the right demographic profile with a messaging and service offerings designed to maximize subscription rates. Site planning is a critical component of designing a wireless, a robust wireless network. With the advent of 5G, this business need is at the forefront again. The design and rollout of 5G wireless technology is cranking up as 5G standards are being finalized. This latest generation of technology utilizes a very different RF coverage profile from 4G and LTE. That in turn impacts the location and density of antenna placements. Analytics are critical in crunching through factors such as bandwidth demand, tower and pole lease options, and terrain profiles. The communication service provider industry is very competitive. We don't get permissions to discuss the, the specifics of the use of, their, of our technology, but let's, let's look at a representative case study that highlights a few of the points that we've made today. Ori County, South Carolina, covers 1,200 square miles and is home to nearly 300 full-time, 300,000 full-time residents. Uh, home to Myrtle Beach and other vacation destinations, it offers a vacation and resort opportunity to millions of people annually. As you can imagine, understanding this fluctuation of population is critical to providing the types of services and safety needed to keep people coming back. Horry County IT team started using insights for ArcGIS to dive deeper into trends within the county. With insights, they can divide the county into submarkets based on locations and businesses that are impacted by high tourism. They can look at a submarket and quickly understand if it's trending up or down based on the previous year and identify which businesses are causing the change. This analysis identifies trends and predicts the outcomes for local businesses, service providers, and government agencies that continually work to accommodate tourists as well as citizens. Well, let's flip to a demonstration on how GIS and analytics might be applied to optimize cell site design in an area that's having high population growth for tourism or other reasons. Tyler, what do you have for us? I want to run through a workflow now that uses a suitability analysis for wireless site planning. Now, obviously, there are a lot of factors wireless operators consider when deploying a new cell site. I'm going to incorporate a few of those in my analysis to detect and quantify the spatial patterns between these factors and in the process determine ideal areas to deploy a new site. 
The first thing we'll look at are all the drop calls that took place within one of our markets. Now to better understand how these points are clustered and how we have where we have more drop calls versus not, I've ran a clustering analysis that finds the natural clusters in my data and groups them accordingly. So now I have a clearer idea of some of the areas that we're going to target in, in our analysis. Next, I want to take a look at all the transactions that took place within our market and find those emerging areas where we're seeing growth in data consumption. To do that, I've created a space time cube that allows me to see our data tonnage values in increments of six months. For example, in this example, I can see this orange color is telling me that we've always had a moderate level of data usage in this area. But once we hit this point, which was mid-year 2016, we saw some of our highest data tonnage values to date, and that's remained consistent up until now. So by visualizing our temporal data using a 3D scene, I could begin to identify those areas that we're going to want to target in this case. But to see these trends throughout our entire data set, I've used a different analysis to help me with this. Instead, I used a emerging hotspot analysis. And we've ArcGIS has always had uh, a hotspot analysis within its core set of geoprocessing tools. And that would use statistics to determine whether a value was significantly hotter or colder compared to its surroundings. The emerging hotspot analysis allows us to incorporate time within this analysis. So not only do I see where we have hotspots, I can see where we have intensifying hotspots, meaning this area has always been hot and it's only getting hotter over time. Another key insight we can derive from this are these new hotspots, ones that weren't always hot until recently. What that allows me to find are these areas where we didn't necessarily expect there to be a lot of usage, and chances are our network is not designed to be able to, to handle the recent demand that we've been finding in this area. So great, we looked at our drop calls, we looked at our transactions and our data tonnage. Let's look at some demographics to help us with our analysis. I brought in a, another census block layer from our living atlas, this time showing me where we have anticipated population growth in the next five years. If we're gonna roll out a new site, we're gonna to wanna to serve our customers today, as well as the ones we anticipate picking up in the near future. What I've done though is aggregate that information into a set of hexagon bins that make up our market area. That way I can tell where we have those areas with growing population. The last factor I want to consider is our existing fiber. To minimize the cost of deploying a site, we're gonna to try to build that as close to our existing fiber backbone as possible. So to ensure we do that, I built a buffer around our existing backbone network. Now the last thing I need to do before we perform the analysis was reclassify our data. For example, I took that clustering output we saw before of our drop calls, and I reclassified that from a scale of one to five, with five being the area we want to prioritize the most. I did the same with our emerging hotspot output, this time from a scale of one to seven. And I did that to our population growth from a scale of one to five. Now that the data has been reclassified, we can take a look at the model that was used. So just like we saw in our last demo, I included all the processes needed to run our suitability analysis within this single geoprocessing task. A key element of this model are these parameters that we've included with default values. So in this case, our buffer distance around the fiber network is set at 5,000 meters. Our population growth is set at that second class and greater. That's the same case with our drop calls, and our data tonnage is targeting that fourth and above class. When we run the model as is, we get these results, finite polygons that fit all of the criteria that we define within our model. Where those parameters come in handy is when I can open this up 
just like I could any of my, of my other geoprocessing tools. And I can go in and change the parameters. So if I need to rerun this analysis using a different set of requirements, I just need to update these parameters. So let's say we're valuing these areas with uh, the largest amount of data tonnage. And same with drop calls. I can change my buffer distance if I need to, rerun the analysis, and I'll get a different set of results based on this specific criteria. So the recap, what we just saw was taking multiple factors that dictate where a wireless carrier will want to deploy a cell site and used an analysis in RTS Pro that detects how their spatial patterns align with each other to determine those suitable areas for deploying a new cell site. Now that we've taken a look at some demonstrations, let's discuss how you can set up and enable spatial analytics within your own organization. For my demonstrations, you saw that I used two main applications. First one was Insights for ArcGIS and ArcGIS Pro. In the back end, though, I had another component that was helping me perform those analyses. ArcGIS Online, which is our fully SaaS and cloud deployment of ArcGIS, was used to bring in those census layers and leverage the demographic data for my geo-enrichment analysis. I also used ArcGIS Enterprise to utilize that historical outage data we saw in Insights that's in a database behind our firewall. Now you can use those components to begin performing the analysis we saw today, but if you wanted to expand on that, you can extend your ArcGIS environment to support additional types of analysis. For example, you can analyze big data using GeoAnalytics uh, Geo Server or process extensive amounts of imagery using Image Server. We also have specialized extensions for ArcGIS Pro, such as Spatial Analyst for more raster-leaning analysis, or geostatistical analysis for incorporating statistical methods within spatial analysis, such as spatial interpolation. Now I'll pass it back to Joe. He'll tell you how you can get started. Well, hopefully everyone's getting some ideas on where and how spatial analytics can be applied in your specific industry. But if you're like me, you have a lot of great ideas floating around in the old memory bank, but sometimes struggle with how to take that first step or two. Well, here's a few ideas. First, think about the fat rabbits. Where is your business facing significant challenges? Where could you bring real business benefit with analytics? Then make sure you start to build your skill sets and expertise by tapping into a variety of the MOOCs, seminars, and professional training that Esri offers. When you're ready to move ahead, don't go it alone. Most of the business challenges you will tackle will be supported by loads of data, but you might need help climbing that mountain. Locate and engage your company's data scientist or business intelligence team. And when you've locked on that killer idea, consider partnering with Esri to launch a strategic proof of concept. You know, for that or any other related analytics needs, remember to contact your Esri account rep. We'll be happy to guide you through the process. And while you're preparing, don't forget to tap into the wealth of information and examples that are offered at our Spatial Stats GitHub site. We'll be sure to provide that link with the follow-up information from today's webinar. So we've seen how to leverage spatial analytical tools that are inherent in the ArcGIS platform. You know, you can achieve significant business benefit by just taking advantage of the capabilities that's in the software that you most likely already own today. But what if you're ready to take that, the impact of location to the next level? Can your business benefit from the next generation of analysis and automation? The opportunity may be closer than you think. You can take advantage of programming and stats with R integration. Applications leveraging real-time and streaming analytics from the ArcGIS Geo Event Server are becoming very common, especially in today's world of the Internet of Things. And Esri can support and run spatial analytics directly in big data environments like Hadoop with a solution we call Big Data Toolkit. We are making significant strides in applying geography and location to advanced learning, something we call geospatial artificial intelligence. You know, I saw a stat recently that said 93% of C-level executives say their company is investing in artificial intelligence. The same is true at Esri. 
We're making significant investments in technology that drives the power of location within applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In fact, Tyler, do we have uh, do we still have time for a quick example of using machine learning in utilities? Sure, we do. So I'm going to go back to our previous demo, and we took the areas we wanted to target for our wireless site planning and used machine learning techniques to find poles that we could potentially use for a wireless site. We looked at a set of imagery within those areas and identified a sample of poles ourselves to create a training data set using TensorFlow. Once it was fully trained using a subset of poles, we then had to detect all the poles within our entire suitable footprint. So as an example, I'll zoom into one of the areas and you can see the objects that were detected. If I zoom into one pole, you can see that light post here and the pole. And you can tell that the machine learning tools were using the shadow casted on the set of imagery to identify those poles. So instead of trying to track down a data set of poles or uh, trying to identify each and every pole ourselves in this set of imagery, We've used TensorFlow in this case to automate major the majority of the process for us. Now, Tom, have we been gathering questions throughout the webinar today? Thanks, thanks Tyler, and uh, thanks Joe. We've actually received a number of Hi Tom, I think we're losing you, but I'm, I'm looking through the questions and I might be able to, to sort through them if you're not able to uh, connect with us. Okay, I see one. It says, where can you use the analytical tools within ArcGIS? And I can I could probably take that one. Um, we, we saw me run some analysis already in Insights and ArcGIS Pro, but we also have some other applications that can run similar tasks. Our web portal technology has already baked in some core geoprocessing tools that can be brought into the web maps and apps that you deployed there. We also have uh, APIs for our developers that can tap into those geoprocessing services too in their own um, custom applications. Okay, let me see another. Okay, here's one. I've heard of a new product called GeoAnalytics. When would I use that versus tools in Pro? That's a good question. We really designed and architected a uh, geoanalytics server to be able to process large amounts of data within an analysis. That way, those workflows that you use in Pro that take long amounts of, of time um, from your workstation or a laptop could then be sent for a server to handle instead. And because of that, you're running those much more uh, efficiently. So many of the same tools you're using in Pro today to run analysis, you can replicate that workflow, but in a server cluster using GeoAnalytics. Okay, let me see. We're back to the third question. Uh, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the, yeah I see there's I see a tool it. about, do these tools require a GIS professional to run? Yes, that's the next question. Uh, yeah, this is Joe. I can take that. So some of the models, as you saw today, some of the models that Tyler was showing were pretty complex. So, uh, you know, a, a GIS geek might be needed to run those. But as much as I love Tyler, I'm happy to say we don't always need him. Actually, you know, when you think about ArcGIS Online and Portal and the web environment, we actually expose, Esri exposes a lot of the core fundamental uh spatial analytical tools right there in that web browser environment. So inside of a web map, I think your everyday business, you know, analysts and users should be able to operate those and derive some very interesting uh, results.
All right, another question. Can you explain a little bit how the analytical tools are licensed? Yeah, that's probably good for me too. Let me let me take a crack. So, yeah, that's a good question. Licensing can get a little complex at time. Um, you know, the core analytical tools that come with our our desktop and server software are just there. So if you if you own desktop, you own server, you're going to get a lot of the core ones with that software. Um, there are actually a number of advanced analytical tools that you can actually license by purchasing specific extensions, say, for example, um, like Spatial Analyst. And, you know, again, for the web users, as I just mentioned, keep in mind that um, those capabilities are just part of your named user license that you use to interact with ArcGIS Online and Portal. Thanks, Joe. Here's another question. How can I automate my analytics? That might be a good one for me to take uh, because we saw me already use model builder and I was taking those multiple spatial processes. You saw that I was able to run those do processing tasks just like I would any other uh, tool in our toolkit. And you know, with model builder, we've also, um, along with model builder, we've also released some Python libraries to incorporate those ArcGIS tools in your own Python scripts. And then you can also uh, schedule those scripts so they can be run at certain intervals, whether it's maybe the start of the work week, once a day or overnight, a couple times a day, once an hour, however frequently you need it to run. Um, one product we, we briefly touched on was GeoEvent Server. And that was that's a server extension that's designed to monitor real-time feeds. So for example, you can have GeoEvent uh, monitor a real-time lightning feed, and once a new strike hits, it can trigger uh, a process that is used to identify which of your assets are within a range of that lightning strike. And then from there, GeoVent can maybe publish those results in a dashboard that we're using to monitor, or maybe it automatically sends out a text message to your field staff that's within that area. So you got plenty of options there for, for automating those tools. Doesn't have to all be done manually. Okay, I think we see another licensing question. Do I need a license for insights to view those workbooks? Well, I ought to take that one then. Um, let's see. So as it comes to insights for ArcGIS, uh, you just have to be a level one or a viewer named user, and you can view and interact with those workbooks that are created by others in your organization. Uh, in terms of actually creating the workbooks, um, you do need to be have an insights license and be a level two named user. Thanks, Joe. I think we have time for one more question. What format does my data need to be in? So naturally, we support a lot of spatial formats out of the box, whether it's enterprise or file geodatabases, shape files, or whatnot. Uh, but we can also take your non-spatial formats and use the spatial attributes within it to represent it in the GIS. Chances are many of your tables have coordinates or addresses or, or some kind of spatial element that we can use to incorporate it into a GIS analysis. And actually, even if you don't have your own data to analyze, we saw me use data from the Living Atlas, and you can use those to run your own analysis on, whether it's census data, uh, physical geography layers, real-time weather feeds, you're, you're certainly welcome to use those too. Okay, everyone, thanks uh, for your questions. We will be sure to follow up uh, with the rest of the questions after the webinar. So this is Joe, I'll finish this up here. You know, I think we're coming up on the top of the hour. I appreciate everyone's participation with us today in this today's webinar. Unfortunately, we didn't get to all the questions. I think we got quite a few more that we collected and we'll be answering those in an FAQ document that we'll make available after this webinar today. Uh, we also want you to remember that we have a very active GeoConnects community user group for electric, gas, and telco customers. This community is a great resource for you all year long. As I mentioned, we'll be having our next meeting in, at the GeoConnects conference in Dallas on November 5th through the 8th. Um, and we're also, as you can see on the screen here, we're also active in a variety of different social media channels, including Twitter, LinkedIn, and GeoNet. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and uh, we hope you have a great day. Thank you very much.